I am coming from a, a scientific perspective. That's what I was asked to speak about. But I actually also want to start with the scripture. O ye, my people, lift up your heads and be comforted. For behold, the time is at hand. Notwithstanding our many strugglings, which have been in vain, yet I trust there remaineth an effectual struggle to be made. Therefore, lift up your heads and rejoice and put your trust in God. So you, you may recognize those are the words of King Limhi speaking to his people who had been in bondage for a long time. And he was trying to uh, motivate them so that they could change, so they could leave. And I find that the mix of hope and grief and resolve in those scriptures encapsulate pretty well my feelings about climate change. Both my feelings informed from a scientific perspective where I'm confronted with on a weekly basis, um, both progress and lack of progress, and from my religious perspective as a, as a member of the Church of Jesus Christ of Latter-day Saints, which requires me to care about my neighbors and love my God. And when I say neighbors, I'm of course talking about all 7.8 billion of my neighbors. Um, so I am an ecosystem ecologist, and that's a, a, an incredibly redundant sounding field, right? <laughs> How many times can we get eco in there? But it's the field of research that studies um, all the energy, materials, and living things that flow through and make up the earth system. So it's looking at ecosystems. And it's common, um, it's common for us to separate humans from nature. But in fact, in my field, there is no distinction. We are completely integrated. Um, science has revealed that we're not only a part of nature, we are now one of the dominant forces in the whole earth system. The, the science writer Oliver Morton said it this way, the paradox in a nutshell is this, humans are grown so powerful that they have become a force of nature. And forces of nature are those things which by definition are beyond the power of humans to control. So this paradox, right? Incredible power, incredible influence, and yet no centralized way of controlling that. And this is, of course, a fulfillment of God's prophecy. <laughs> One of the first prophecies that we know of, uh, when God told Moses that humans would have dominion over the earth and all of her inhabitants. Now, that was incredibly uh, unlikely at the time that that was said, uh, 3,500 years ago, when there were fewer, fewer humans than there are types of organisms on earth. Uh, but we now see thanks to science, which allows us to, to view the whole earth system, that that prophecy has become true. Both scriptures and science uh, give us warnings about our power. I, uh, Paul's already given a fabulous um, spiritual interpretation. Farina will give uh, one better than I'm qualified to give. So I'll leave that to them, the spiritual and social dimensions. But from the scientific side, one of my favorite thinkers and writers is the paleontologist uh, Stephen Jay Gould. And Here's what he said about dominion and about our, how we should view ourselves in the earth system. He, he says, look in the mirror and don't be tempted to equate transient domination with either intrinsic superiority or prospects for extended survival. So he's coming from a paleontological perspective, looking at the whole history of creation. And of course made that observation that there are many species in the past who have become dominant in the earth system. That dominance, that power in itself is neither good nor bad. It's how we use it. And we are uniquely, um, uniquely situated, not only because of science, but also because of uh, our social and cultural uh, understanding to use that power for good. So let's move beyond um, general principles and ask, how are we doing in our dominion of the earth? Um, well, whoever it was that said it was the worst of times, uh, it, it was the best of times, it was the worst of times. I'm convinced that they were talking about 2020. Um, I think that was Toby Maguire, right, who said that. Um, <laughs> um, on one hand, there are amazing changes happening in our communities, in our nations, 
and at the global scale. Um, Paul has, has laid out just a few of them. Going from a scientific perspective, there are changes that are transforming how we gather and share energy and resources. There are changes that are reducing our waste and our pollution, changes that are enhancing our health and conserving the integrity, sustaining the earth. Just as one example of the efficacy of these advances, the, the technological, economic, and social progress that we've made since 2000 means that we are on a trajectory that is well below what we used to call business as usual. So if you look at where our emissions are tracking, we are well below what we used to think was kind of the do nothing scenario. So we, we are making a difference. Um, also solar and wind energy are, are now cheaper and growing faster than their dirty fossil fuel alternatives. These are great changes that are happening. But there is, there's another side as well. Uh, there is terrible momentum in the Earth system, including in humans. Powerful economic interests and deep cultural currents are harming individuals and hampering progress in global and personal ways. Uh, each year, we burn more dirty fossil fuels than the last. We have not yet turned the corner. It's not just that we are still burning fossil fuels, it's that we're burning more and more each year. Despite a clear knowledge of how that use of this resource is affecting the earth and the human family. That for me is the most troubling as a human. We know what the consequences are of our overconsumption and yet we continue. The, this is a really sobering fact. Uh, the, the, the fossil fuel powered machines that we have already made, the existing vehicles, furnaces, power plants, if we do not retire them early, they will take us beyond our two degrees of warming um, uh, target. We don't have to build a single new automobile, a single new power plant, just the ones that we have built now. We call those committed emissions in, in the climate research world. So if, if we wanna hit that goal of two degrees Celsius or lower, which is based on our, our best though incomplete understanding of the earth system, we need to have our emissions in the next 10 years. We need to cut them by 50% in the next 10 years. And then we need to do that again in the 10 years after that, and again in the 10 years after that. That's not something that's going to happen automatically. For, for reference, in 2020, because of the COVID-19 pandemic, uh, our emissions are expected to be four to 7% lower than they were in 2019. So finally in the right direction. But 2020 is of course an outlier with uh, unique uh, events that are, that are going on. So we, we need to have a plan of how to make that happen. The, the, the magnitude and speed of the environmental degradation that we are seeing is already causing immense harm to our society. And it is very likely to trigger responses in the earth system that are so vast, they are well beyond our control. Again, we are powerful, we are dominant, but we don't have uh, we don't have a steering wheel. We don't have a, a, um, a panel of buttons where we can slow things down or speed them up. It's a, a blunt control. So I'm not going to try to convince you that climate change uh, is serious or that it is caused by humans. There are fabulous sources that can do that much better than I can. Um, I will say, however, I work with researchers in the public and private sector, including many funded uh, and employed by ExxonMobil and BP, as well as the National Science Foundation, other groups. Their experiments and observations show the same conclusions that, that mine do. Climate change is happening. It is caused overwhelmingly by the overconsumption of fossil fuels producing greenhouse gases, and it is very bad news. It's not just an environmental change like those that have happened before. It is unprecedented in the Earth's history. The speed and magnitude of this change is qualitatively different than what we have seen before. So I'm gonna share my screen briefly here uh, just to point you to a few resources. Let me see if I can manipulate. <laughs> here I am talking about manipulating the whole Earth system. I don't even know if I can get my computer to show you what I want it to show. <laughs> Let's give it a try. Um, Okay. All right. I think that you should be able to see. Can you see my screen? Okay, thank you. Um, 
Uh oh, it looks like I started in the wrong place. So if you are, if you are skeptical of um, climate science or if you just want to learn more, here are three of my favorite resources where you can go to get unbiased, apolitical information about what's actually going on in the Earth system. These, all three of these are um, run by uh, scientists or have scientific consultants who are contributing to them. Um, on the solution side, there's no way even in a full day symposium that we can talk about what options do we have. Here are three of my favorite um, climate solution resources, Project Drawdown, Citizens Climate Lobby, and, and Rewiring America. Um, take a look at those. Um, if we want to know, uh, if we want to know how to solve this problem, we need to know what's causing it. Here is the, a little report card. Um, this is a donut that sh is showing where CO2 is coming from. It's actually showing all greenhouse gases, but that's predominantly CO2. And one, one uh, fact that's very interesting to me and influential to me is CO2 is the number one thing that we as human beings produce. About 38 billion tons of it every year. We produce so much CO2 that it actually is more than all things that we produce. All of the food, cement, waste, garbage, plastic, any of, if you add all of those things up together, they don't come anywhere near the amount of CO2 that we produce. It is our number one product. And here's where it's coming from. Electrical production, food, agricultural, and land use, industry, transportation, buildings, and then other is things like um, how we secure the fossil fuels, how we bring them to us. Um, this, now, I, I will mention the donut looks a little bit different for the United States. Because of our lifestyle, mainly because of our vehicles, our single largest contributor is actually transportation. That's mainly the cars that we drive, um, the vehicles that we drive. But this is at a global scale. This is where the problem is coming from. Now, you're going to hear a lot of things about CO2. <laughs> I hear them all the time as a researcher. CO2 is good. Plants have to have CO2. Uh, it's not a pollutant. It's not damaging to people. Uh, some of those things have kernels of truth in them. Um, and again, I'm going to leave, uh, leave it to you to look at uh, the science. Look at those resources that I showed on the previous slide. But I'm going to just point to one thing. Um, uh, I'll skip ahead to here. If we were just producing CO2, it would still be really bad for the Earth system. That would still be causing climate change. But we're producing CO2 by burning fossil fuels. And those fossil fuels are producing air pollution, water pollution, soil pollution. This is a graph that uh, one of my graduate students, Isabella Arrigo, uh, put together for a paper where she compiled what is the, what is the health burden of environmental pollution. And up here, this is, this is a graph shown in millions of premature deaths per year. The environmental pollution, which is primarily uh, air pollution caused by fossil fuel burning, is causing 15 to 16 million premature deaths a year. So I'm not going to go through all of these other causes of death, but just to put that in context, it is literally hundreds of times more people than are dying from war and terrorism. It's even many dozens of times more people than are dying of suicide and many other very serious issues. This, this issue of environmental pollution should be motivating to us both as citizens of the world and as members of the church, as members of the body of Christ. Um, we recently passed this very grim milestone in the United States of 200,000 deaths uh, from COVID-19. Air pollution causes 200,000 deaths in the United States every year. It is like COVID-19 year after year after year, and yet it is an invisible problem. It's one that we've gotten used to. Somehow, we've gotten to a place where we feel like, oh, that's just what we need to do to support our economy. That is not the case. We have options now. And that's what I want to talk about um, in the, with the rest of my time. But but here, this is a really comforting scripture to me from the Apostle Paul, because it's easy to feel discouraged. Uh, I get almost as many, <laughs> I get calls from people who think that global, uh, that global climate change is not a problem. I also get a lot of calls from people who are, are despondent, who are experiencing depression and anxiety because of the environmental degradation that they see. And this is a guiding light for me, this scripture. Um, Paul, of course, rejoices that the people he was writing to are, 
are unhappy. And that maybe sounds unkind, but he gives us a reason why. Uh, For godly sorrow worketh repentance to salvation, not to be repented of, but the sorrow of the world worketh death. So I encourage you, if you're feeling discouragement because of the size of these environmental issues, set that aside. That comes from the world. That comes from the adversary. However, if you're willing to have your heart be softened, if you're willing to engage and learn about what consequences our actions are having, if you want to take responsibility for what you are doing and for what we are doing, then please let this alarm work in you in a positive way that can motivate and help you move forward. Uh, Here's one of the most amazing things that we can do and most comforting things we can do. We now have renewable energy. This renewable energy is cheaper than fossil fuels. If we were to invest in the renewable energy that we need, it would create 25 million new jobs, local jobs in the United States alone. It's going to reduce pollution. Uh, it's going to solve climate change as a side effect, right? From, uh, from reducing those fossil fuels. It's going to solve some of these environmental justice and social justice issues that we have. Transportation, right? One of the biggest things that we're doing, ride your bike. It's going to reduce the energy that you're consuming by 99%. At the same time, there are all of these side effects, these positive side effects. It's going to build your community, uh, reinforce your health. Change your diet. We're blessed as uh, members of the church to know that we're not supposed to eat meat unless we have to. Following the word of wisdom reduces uh, that. Remember, about a quarter of our uh, greenhouse gases are coming from agriculture. It reduces that environmental footprint by about 85%. We could feed nine people for the energy and land and water feeding one person currently if we changed from the typical American diet to a plant-based diet. This is something that we have control over. We can choose to make these changes. And finally, I put up here just to picture the state capitol, but I'm using that to symbolize civic and community involvement. We don't have to just think about, hey, what do I have to do? What's the responsibility of me? But we have examples today of so many people who are going beyond building networks, moving towards real lasting solutions. Um, And that's going to have positive benefits throughout everything that we do. So I'm going to just end with this this scripture from from our Savior and Lord, who told us, when when asked, what is the the most important thing? When asked, (laughs) I think about this uh, as as a teacher, when asked what is going to be on the test, this is what Jesus said. We should know this. We should all write this down. Thou shalt love the Lord thy God with all thy heart and with all thy soul, and with all thy mind. This is the first and great commandment. And the second is like unto it. Thou shalt love thy neighbor as thyself. On these two commandments hang all the law and the prophets. So why do I care about the environment? Because I cannot fulfill these two great commandments without reverencing the creation and without having concern for my neighbors, without taking responsibility how my, uh, for how my actions effect for better and for worse, those around me and those around the world. So we have the promise from God that it is not in vain, that it is not too late. Let us take faith and let us make a difference. I say this in the name of Jesus Christ. Amen.